Um, first off, thank you so much for staying up late for us. Uh, we're sorry for the little delay. We had a, uh, I'm so glad fire. you're not in a real fire. <laughs> we're, we're not in a real fire, but it added a certain a heightened level of realism to the film. Um, and on behalf of the uh, College of Arts and Letters and the Dean's Special of the Arts in Sacramento State, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It's, uh, oh, it's such a pleasure. It's such a pleasure. Yeah, so um, the audience so far has seen the act of killing. Uh, after after we chat with you, we'll um, we'll be screening the look of silence. And I was thinking that we'd uh, I'd give you a few questions for about uh, thirty minutes, and then some questions from the audience after that. I know that there were some questions during our fire emergency. Okay. That's great. Great. Go ahead. So um, I've uh, read various interviews with you and seen interviews with you over the years, and my understanding is this wasn't the original film project you set out to make. You're actually investigating labor environmental issues around uh, the palm oil industry. Could you talk about that and how you, you got to the process of making these films? Well, I, I, it's not so much that I was uh, set out to make a different film originally. If I set out to make a film uh, that was different, it's very much like the film you're about to see, The, the Look of Silence. Uh, that's in a way, at least sort of thematically and spiritually, the film I set out to make. What you're referring to is that before I learned about the 1965 genocide in 2001, I went to Indonesia for the first time to run a filmmaking workshop for plantation workers, a six-month workshop, so it was really immersive and intense, where they would make a film about their struggle to organize a union in the aftermath of the Suharto dictatorship, under which unions had been illegal. And when I arrived, I, I, I knew nothing about the country. I found myself in my mid-twenties on this Belgian-owned oil palm plantation. And the Belgian company gave the women workers the supposedly easy work of spraying the pesticides and the herbicides, physically easier, except that they weren't given any protective clothing. And they were dying of liver failure in their forties. And uh, the first thing they did in the union was to try and understand what was causing this. We identified one of the herbicides. They asked for protective clothing. And the company hired Panchasila Youth, the group at the center of the film you've just seen, to threaten and attack the workers. The workers said to me, we're not going to pursue this. We can't pursue this. Even though the herbicide, this, this chemical is killing us, we cannot uh, take this further because our parent, there was a mass killing here in 1965. Our parents and grandparents were killed uh, by this group with the army. This group's more powerful than ever before. We're afraid that the killings could happen again if we pursue this. And they dropped it. And I understood what was going to kill those women was not only poison, but also fear. And then they said, why don't you come back after they made their film? It's actually online, not film. It's called, it's on YouTube and it's called the globalization tapes the film the plantation workers made um, but they said then why don't you come back and now you make a film that would be too sensitive for us to make about why after all these decades we're still afraid and i went back and started working with the survivors in that village particularly the family you'll see in the in the look of silence and they started gathering more and more survivors to tell me their stories but after three weeks the army threatened the survivors not to participate in the film and said don't give up uh, and, so, and, and, and then the survivors called me to this midnight meeting where they said, don't give up. Uh, you're here, you speak the language. Try to film the perpetrators. You can't film uh, us film the perpetrators. And that uh, led to two years of filming every perpetrator I could find across the region. And you'll see some of that early material with the perpetrators. That's from 2003 to 2005 in The Look of Silence. It's the older material that you'll see the main character watching. And then the 41st perpetrator I met was Anwar Congo. And that's, and I lingered on him in a way because I felt his pain was close to the surface, that he was boasting, not really out of pride, but out of a desire to run away from, a need to run away from the pain that would come by thinking about this. And, and that, uh, intrigued by that feeling that there was some important lesson in there about how we as human beings live with acts of evil that we commit and what that guilt transformed sort of grotesquely into boasting does to our societies. Uh, what that means for us, I, I spent five years shooting that act of killing and then returned at the end when I uh, could safely do so to make the look of silence with Adi, with Adi, the main character in the look of silence and the one who started me on this journey. 
Wow, that's, that's really incredible. Um, so, I mean, you, you talked about this, but what, what were Anwar Congo's motivations for participating in this? Um, is it to brag? Is it, towards the end, it's, it is in a way darkly therapeutic for him? What, and, and, and also for um, the other, the other uh, Premans uh, that are in his entourage, uh, Herman, for example, what, why was he participating in this project? Um, I think that uh, initially there, it was a mixture. I think that, I think superficially at the at the very start, maybe Anwar always wanted to be in a film. He loved films. There was an element of vanity, and, and I think for Herman to be invited along by the man he's most admired and has been sort of leader and idol his whole uh, life as a preman, that was that was enough to make Herman want to do it. But I think over time. The motivation shifted. I think Anwar. Uh, I think Anwar. I think you know. You said, was it just that it was a chance to boast? And I think that's that raises a question: What are we doing when we are boasting? And if you think of the experience of boasting, I'm sure none of us are proud of boasting, but I'm sure all of us have done it at some point or another. And uh, even the most modest of you. Uh, in the in the classroom now, if you can go back and remember what the feeling is like of boasting, even if you don't do it often, I'd say that we never boast because we uh, are truly proud of ourselves. On the contrary, I think we boast because we uh, are insecure. We're like birds who puff out our feathers to make ourselves look bigger because we know we're small. So I think boasting is always a compensatory kind of defensive mask. And I think Anwar... Uh, had me boasted because it, yes, he was. It was a way of establishing that he establishing a sort of victor's history and write, writing himself into a victor's history in a way in which uh, the hero he suddenly became uh, a protagonist in the quote unquote, the sort of quote unquote heroic extermination of the communists. But I think very quickly. Uh, as, he, as he described in the very first scene on the roof, whenever he would talk about it, he would feel pain. If he would think about it, he would worry about going crazy. So uh, he would look to me to see how I was reacting. And I think he saw that I was not pretending to think what he did was great, unlike his paramilitary colleagues. I would listen to what he did, and I would be honest if I was upset by it. Uh, as soon, and especially once he started opening up to me about his nightmares, I could honestly respond and say that what he was telling me was giving me nightmares too. And I think he saw that actually I was seeing him as guilty, but still human. You see, I think the reason Omar was never able to acknowledge that what he did was wrong was not because he was so invested in, in being a hero, but because he wouldn't know how to live with himself as a human being if he had acknowledge the real meaning of what he's done. And I'm not saying that um, I would know how to live with myself as a human being if I was Anwar, but I think the very fact that I refused to see him as anything other than a human being, because I insisted that in order to understand how human beings do this, do these things to each other, we have to understand that every perpetrator in human history has been a human being like us. We have to see him as a human being. I think that he found comfort in that. Suddenly he could be guilty and human. And I think he wanted to continue and open up sort of head, oh, not, not, uh, not consistently and without, uh, without if you would sort of two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, he would open up and he would become frightened by what he uh, exposed and then take a step back and say maybe... Uh, and, and sort of and, and try and glorify it again, but he would, I think he was opening up because he had a need to be able to get off his chest somehow what he did with someone who wouldn't say it was right or acceptable or justifiable, mm -hmm. but who would accept him as a human being. And I think Hermann uh, gradually over the course of the film became disgusted, honestly, uh, or disappointed. Because when Her when the film came out in the media dis after Anwar Congo, dis disappointed it. in Anwar Congo, or disgusted, it's something bigger even. I think in the whole, I think he learned through the film because he still cares about Anwar Congo, as do I. We're still Anwar Congo and I and Herman and Anwar are in frequent touch. But uh, when when the film came out in Indonesia, the 
uh, paramilitary group, of course, condemned the film immediately, as did the Indonesian military. And Hermann, I think, was furious by what he saw as hypocrisy. But I think it was more than that, actually. I think I, when I was editing the film and I put that sort of crazy final shot of Hermann beating wildly on, the last final shot of Hermann, where he's beating wildly on those drums, people would ask, what, what does that shot mean? It's so... And, and, they, and then I said, do you not like it? And they said, no, 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 it should be there, but I just don't have any words for it. And I don't think I had words for it either until after the film came out. And then um, Hermann and, and the paramilitary group condemned the film, and then Hermann uh, quit Panchasili Youth and started holding public screenings of the film in Maidan. He was one of the only people with the courage to do so, to, to show the film publicly in the city of Maidan. Uh, and I think that that... So I came to understand, you know, Hermann's being picked on throughout the film by Anna. He's discovering that the source of his power and prestige as a, as a gangster, a political gangster in this society, uh, comes from something really ugly that he spends five years uh, with me exploring, mass murder, torture, that it's destroyed even Anwar. He sees that he witnesses that. And I think that he just, I think that there's, as Werner Herzog said when he saw the film, he said, Hermann is like the goddess of vengeance. No, sorry, the goddess of destiny. That Anwar has this rendezvous with his conscience, his ra this rendezvous with destiny, which is a, ultimately with his own conscience. And Hermann is the vehicle for that. I think Hermann had a growing, maybe disgust was the wrong word before, but a kind of growing rage, a growing anger, a growing fury at what, what this society has is based on what his position in the society is based on. Maybe it's a sort of, yeah. So Hermann has been loyal, they've both been, they've both been, uh, when Anwar saw the film, he was very moved by it. He was uh, silent, he was tearful for a long time, and then he said, Joshua, this film shows what it's like to be me. And I said, how does that make you feel? And he said, I'm relieved, because I think he found a kind of, ability to see himself as the human being he is and see that he's done something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Somehow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about halfway through the film, um, you raise the issue of uh, justice and war crimes, uh, where you're, the scene where you're driving in the car with... Um, uh, Adi. Adi, yeah. Yeah, and he yeah. gives us this famous talk about victor's justice and so forth. Um, how did Anwar Congo respond to any discussions of uh, the possibility of uh, human rights uh, trials or the Hague? And, and, and also, is there any possibility that they will see uh, institutionalized justice for admitting to these crimes on film? Um. The, I'll, answer, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. The reaction, the film really shows that uh, there, that this is a systemic problem. And that was the Indonesian media's first response to the film. So the first screening, the act of killing came out widely in Indonesia, but initially through closed screenings. Mm -hmm. And only once the media lined up behind the film in Indonesia did the screenings become public. And the editor of Indonesia's leading news magazine came to the very first closed screening, kind of the equivalent of Time magazine, but a, but a bigger publication. Uh, and he said, called me the next day, and he said, I've seen your film, and I have been censoring stories about the killings for as long as I've been in his job. Is this Tempo? And I'm not going Tempo, to do it. Tempo magazine? Tempo. Yeah. Tempo, yeah. And I, I'm not going to do it anymore. And I'm going to, uh, because I, and he said, because I don't want to grow old as a perpetrator like Anwar Congo. And so we're going to break our silence on the killings by sending journalists all over the country to show that this is a repeat, your film is a repeatable experiment. You could have made this anywhere. And he sent actually 60 journalists all over the country for two weeks to look for men like Anwar who would boast and came up with in two weeks a thousand pages of boastful per, uh, testimony from perpetrators in regions of the country where no one had ever heard of the killings before. They published a double edition of the magazine based on this material. It sold out through three printings, in part because the military was buying up copies, I've heard. But they then put it online, of course, and, and published it as a book to make sure people got to see it. And 
fundamentally very quickly it framed the debate in a very constructive way, but I think in a way that I, at least a way that I hope the film also shows, which is that, you know, Anwar was, as one character says, as the newspaper publisher says in the film, one of thousands. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, in that sense, the, I think that the, react, the sense has been that there needs to be, the, the sense from the human rights community, from the survivors community, uh, and those who are calling for justice, which includes me, is that there needs to be a truth commission, there needs to be a process of justice on the findings of a robust truth commission which is tasked with going into every region, every county, every town and finding out how the killings were perpetrated in each location and by whom. And you must work your way down a chain of command, not up a chain of command. Justice must always start up at the top mm -hmm. and work down. Otherwise you, uh, you find, otherwise you scapegoat the low-ranking perpetrators and you uh, reassure the commanders that so long as they're willing to sacrifice their, uh, the, the, the men in their command, that they can do this again. You, so, so justice that starts from the bottom and works its way up isn't justice, it actually is a form of reinforcing impunity. And luckily the Indonesian human rights community has recognized this and so there hasn't been a move to go after Anwar as such, but there has certainly been a transformation in how the country talks about its past and the national conversation uh, led now by the mainstream media saying that there needs to be truth, justice, and reconciliation. And just last, two weeks ago, was a government's, the first officially sponsored uh, public forum for talking about the crimes uh, held by the President's Advisory Council on the National Human Rights Commission. Uh, and it led, and then in the, in the wake of it, the President uh, instructed his security minister to start gathering evidence of mass graves. So an, an investigation emerging from the conversations out of the two films is hopefully beginning now, but it is it is a long process. The question about the you had one there was another part of your question. Can you remind me? It's, it's oh, I forgot. The first part. Well, what did I say? The first part was Anwar's view on getting it. Anwar's Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I'm sorry. So it's midnight here, so I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> what, what I can do coherently. But, yeah, no, Anwar, so uh, I think you actually get a glimpse of that in the film, where uh, when Adi Zulkadri and Anwar are fishing, mm -hmm. and... Adi said, why can't there be an apology? And for Adi, for Anwar to hear that at that point, it sort of threw open the floodgates to, uh, to, his, to his conscience, really. He starts to end his trauma, and he starts talking about having not being able to, about having nightmares, and about uh, the, 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 the survivors cursing us secretly because they're too afraid to curse us out loud. But really, he's talking almost about the ghosts that visit him at night. And so he switches immediately from talking about the survivors to, the, to the, uh, what he sees in his nightmares. I think that for the longest time, talk of human rights was threatening to Anwar's conscience, as I think it was to so many military commanders, which is why part of the reason it wasn't simply Machiavellian uh, sort of attempts to retain power. I think it also is uh, about not. I think there's a deep resistance among commanders to not resist admitting what they to admitting what they've done was wrong, so that they don't have to live with their conscience. I think it would make Anwar feel guilty. I think now that Anwar has, in a way, been very publicly been identified as the one perpetrator who's had the courage to acknowledge that what he did was wrong, even through this kind of contorted, painful process, and even though I, I honestly think his acknowledgement isn't consistent at the end, it's real, it's sincere, but he's still desperately trying to say that he thought it was the right thing to do, but his retching interrupts him. I'm talking about at the end when he says, my conscience told me they had to be killed. He's still not willing to say that he knew it was wrong at the time. In any case, I think now that he's so publicly known of having retched over what he did, I think that uh, he doesn't, he is understandably nervous that he would be singled out because he's like the most, he's sort of the, the most well-known perpetrator in the country now. But there haven't been any calls to single him out in that way. And, um, 
he ha hasn't had the courage to join the human rights community. Though I shouldn't say that he, he has. He, Herman hasn't either. Herman's just screened the film. That, that's, that's pretty amazing in and of itself. It, it is amazing. Yeah, yeah, I think it is pretty amazing. So I want to ask you some questions about the, uh, the construction of the film. Um, the, the film reminded me so much of uh, the reenactions. The Rithi Pons film, uh, S21, on the Khmer Rouge killing machine, where he has uh, a prison guard and a former um, prisoner of the Khmer Rouge interrogation center reenact some of their uh, the daily routine. And earlier you've written that um, reenactment can essentially uh, perform uh, a role as a critical and uh, interventionist historiographic uh, or historiographic intervention in this um, in this story, and that the performative nature of terror in Indonesia is so important at the time of the killings, but also in the nature of the New Order's regime. And that the dictatorship governs from 1966 up until the fall of Suharto in 1998, so some 32 years. And uh, this uh, story of the murder of the generals is so important to that. Um, so what, why did you choose reenactment as part of the film? And um, what, uh, what purposes does it serve as its historiographic intervention? Well, first of all, I just want to say one thing about sort of the idea that the dictatorship ended in 1998, mm -hmm. and nominally that's true. Yeah. But the military today in Indonesia is still effectively above the law. Uh, the president is not the commander-in-chief in any sense, um, except maybe on paper. And even there, it's not totally clear it, it, to the extent that it is in the United States. So if an army general were to massacre an entire village in Indonesia, he cannot be put on trial in a civil, in a regular court. He cannot, the only way he can face justice inside Indonesia is if the military itself decides to court-martial him. So if it's, if the military decides to massacre the village, uh, unless they have a change of heart, they won't do that. They might go after some uh, bad apple, lower ranking soldiers and, and scapegoat them, but essentially this means that the military is above the law. And when the military is above the law, it becomes the law. And any time you have a real standoff between the elected government and the military, uh, the military prevails. So I think in many ways what the films emphasize is continuity with the military dictatorship much more than they emphasize uh, or, or sort of depict a serious break in 1998. Of course, I couldn't have made these films under the more intensive military surveillance that existed under, under the dictatorship, but... Uh, Look at that talk show you saw in the, in the film today. It, it, look at how state television is talking about this and how they're inviting paramilitary thugs to fill an audience. Um, I, in terms of the, the question about reenactment, I think it really, I, I, I wanted to start by talking about the continuity of the military dictatorship today or the military's power today because I think that the reenactments are really concerned with the present to such a degree that I wouldn't normally use the word reenactment. Maybe, maybe since I wrote those words that you quoted, uh, I, I've stopped using those words. I think reenactment really is a technique for making the documentarians use to make visible a past which is no longer available to be filmed, or as Rithi does, to sort of conjure a past into the present. I think that the reenactments function that way at times in the final film noir scenes with Anwar where some, he starts reliving some kind of trauma. But I think for the most part, I would say that these are not reenactments. These are performances. These are acting. This is acting. And I say that because uh, I would say that, that because it, it, I would draw it, I would say this is a distinction between being focused on the past versus the present. So I would say that they're acting out, performing the present day lies, fantasies, stories, that the perpetrators tell themselves so that they can live with themselves, and which then they've imposed on the whole society such terrible effect. And in that sense, I'd say that uh, I would agree with the idea that it's a, it's a historiographic intervention in the sense that um, the perp in exactly in, 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 this, in, in the sense that that was why we made the film. When Adi Rukun, the main character in The Look of Silence, and his family and survivors he gathered to tell their stories before they were threatened by the army back in 2003, when he saw the first material with the, with the perpetrators that I was filming, 
He said Joshua continued to film the perpetrators because anyone who sees the way they're talking about this will be forced to acknowledge that in a terrible way, the genocide hasn't ended because the perpetrators are still in power and millions of people are, are still being destroyed by fear. And I knew at that time that from the plantation workers that people were still dying, a little bit indirectly, but still dying because of fear. And I felt, uh, and so in a sense, I always intended the film to be an intervention that uh, holds a kind of mirror up to Indonesia and does exactly what Adi Zulkadri uh, fears that it will do. He says, if we succeed in making this film, it will show everybody in the country that their suspicions are correct, that our propaganda is a lie, and that what we did was wrong. And so it was always intended as a kind of historiographic intervention, but I would say the contrast with Rithi Khan's work is that uh, Rithi's working in a context where uh, Khmer Rouge has been not necessarily perfectly, but largely removed from power. There are tribunals. Uh, Doik, the man who, the main perpetrator you see, in S21 is now in prison. Um, and I'm working in a context of complete impunity. And I would say my film is about impunity in the present, not about the massacres in 1965. Whereas I think S21 really is in the most complicated and beautiful way about the massacres in, in, in the 1970, in 1975 in, in Cambodia. And just, just so the audience knows, it's not just that the, jet, the, the army has a tremendous amount of power, in Indonesia today, but in terms of the so-called civilian political leadership, the majority of the highest elected officials have direct connections and family connections to the army and to the dictatorship, uh, including being sons-in-law mm -hmm. of the former dictator, or the, the last president was the son-in-law of the um, uh, of Saro Edi, who was uh, the uh, one of the most prominent generals in the. In the massacres. Right, so it is actually was mentioned in the film, yeah. in the talk yeah. show on TVRI, the, the talk show host says, ask the question, Saro Edi, we father-in-law of the yeah. president, boasted about killing two and a half million people. Yeah. Uh, actually, she got it wrong. He said on his deathbed that he killed three million people. Three million, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what about the the context of the Cold War and American involvement in this history in 65, 66? Uh, I know that you've been well, involved in, in uh, trying to pressure the Obama administration to declassify documents. Could you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the, the details of how involved America was, us, whether we simply supported the genocide with weapons and money and training and to what extent we supported, how, how extensive that, uh, whether we simply supported the killing machine once it got going, or whether we masterminded, helped to mastermind the events that would be used as a pretext for the killing, this is unknown. Uh, the, this is unknown because the documents that historians have asked for that would provide this information are censored or classified. There was a, the, the leading historian on the issue put in a Freedom of Information Act request Where Bradley Simpson? 16 years ago. Yeah, I think it was in 2000. Or no, 2004. It was 12 or 16. 12 years ago. And he got back, it was 12 years ago, and he got back 16 pages. He'd asked for like 50,000 pages. He got back 16 pages, and the first uh, page was a, a letter. <laughs> to him saying this is what you have and then basically the, the next page two said this is a meeting between blank and blank held at blank on blank date here are the minutes colon and then there's 15 pages of blank that's what he got after 12 years and so after the oscars um this year the national one of the national human rights commissioners came and from Indonesia, the National Human Rights Commission of Indonesia is the official distributor of the Book of Silence in Indonesia. So we came to the Oscars and then came with us to Washington. And we had meetings at the State Department at the White House and with uh, Senator Tom Udall, who introduced a resolution in the Senate saying the U.S. should declassify these documents. But we, he delivered a letter from the National Human Rights Commission to President Obama asking for the documents to be declassified. But what, what we do know is, and, and, and the U.S. has a precedent, there is a precedent of declassifying documents in response to a request like that. Uh, we've just done it in Argentina, for example, about the U.S. support for death squads there. 
In any case, um, what we do know is terrible. We know that the United States <coughs> provided lists of thousands of names, uh, around 5,000 names, of uh, pub largely public figures, political activists, uh, writers, artists, intellectuals, uh, people who, trade union leaders, people who the U.S. thought would be opposed to the new military regime or had communist inclinations. Gave, and the U.S. gave these uh, lists to the Indonesian military, essentially saying, check off these names because you go and give us back lists when you're done. So essentially, the U.S. gave death lists to the Indonesian government. We don't, but, but how many millions of dollars were given, how much is, training was made available, this we don't know yet. You will see a really t two very chilling moments in the look of silence. One where a death squad leader looks directly at me as an American, and therefore I'm right behind the camera, so he looks directly at you as an American viewer, and says I should be given a prize of a cruise to the United States because it was the United States that taught me to hate and kill the communists. And then another, you see a really disturbing NBC documentary from 1967 where the journalist reports on the killings as though, not as though they're good news, he's quite honest about the numbers of people being killed, but he interviews a death squad leader who says that Bali is now more beautiful without the communists, and he just sort of accepts this. And you see in this NBC documentary that uh, uh, the plantations, American-owned plantations, are being used, are, uh, using prisoners from concentration camps, who actually many of whom then were dispatched out to be killed, as forced labor. So, it's American companies using slave labor in the in the late sixties and early seventies. It's a pretty big stain on our claim to be a force for freedom and democracy in the post-war world. Um. So I want to ask you about the use of the term genocide, at least in the promotion of the film. Um, according to the UN definition of genocide, uh, Indonesia probably wouldn't be classified as a genocide. It's a politicide. Um, is there a reason we use the, that terminology? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, actually, I want to. I just now. I just was making notes on this. I'm going to grab my. I'm going to pull it up. Um, because it's exactly about this. And I just wrote this. Uh, it's, it's more precise than I could say. Okay. okay. Um, I have said, I would say, uh, first of all, we routinely speak about the Cambodian genocide as a genocide, but it was also a politicide. Uh, secondly, the the fact that, um, secondly, uh, I'll, I'll ignore my notes. <laughs> but I did, I, um, secondly, of course, the fact that ethnic Chinese were being singled out simply because they were Chinese does, in fact, qualify as a genocide under even the UN definition. But the reason the UN definition does, excludes political killings is, of course, because when the uh, genocide conventions were being drafted after World War II, uh, the Soviet Union pressured to exclude political killings because Stalin didn't want the mass murder over which he presided to be kept quali to qualify as genocide and as the ally that actually did most of the heavy lifting in, in World War II, uh, the, the Western allies were not, were not about to, to, to say no to that. So, Basically, the Soviet Union got political killing excluded from genocide I, from the definition. Some definitions, some dictionaries do say do include um, uh, killing of political groups, including the uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary uh, includes it. But I think there's a more profound point to be made here. Not only is genocide the word, the only word we have that has that moral force. I would also question. Uh, particularly in a society where the victims have been framed ever since the killings as atheists, and particularly when they were killed for humanist beliefs having to do with a uh, vision of social justice, mm -hmm. to what extent we can meaningfully say that cosmology of kind of shared social justice and solidarity, which is what the, the, the 
the writers, the artists, the, the, the union members, the union leaders, and others had in common. Um, to what extent can you really distinguish that meaningfully from a religious identity, mm -hmm. particularly in a time when many of us don't have a religion? But if you were suddenly told because you don't have a religion, and because you're not a person of faith, and because you have this kind of view of human, of, of what society should be and how we should live together as human beings, we're going to kill you. I fail to see a, a relevant moral distinction. And given that uh, many sociologists will use, uh, will, 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 will argue for including politicide in, in the category of genocide, mm -hmm. if it's an attempt to wipe out, uh, annihilate a whole group of people, um, and there's, for, for, their, for a belief system. I, 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 I would say that the UN definition is wrong because the Soviet lobbying effort uh, corrupted our, our, our internet, the definition under international law. And thankfully, some dictionaries see a different, a different definition. But even under international law, actually, Jess Melvin, uh, uh, in, in her doctoral dissertation, showed how across the country Chinese were singled out. And that alone qualifies it under the international definition, I believe. Yeah. I think your, your point about atheism is, uh, is actually really excellent. And one of the, the details about the Suharto dictatorship is that um, after 1966, you had religion listed on your ID card, and you did not get to leave that blank. And as a young undergraduate in the 19, in 19 Eighty something. Um, <laughs> um, I, I was taught that you know you always answer a religion when asked what your religion is. A sort of casual conversation. And all no, no, people go to jail still for. I mean, there's like the in Suma, in West Sumatra last year there was an atheist Facebook page, and the I think actually the man's still in jail. I mean, it's like he's been in jail for a year for this for refusing to take it down, and that sounds like someone refusing to to. Uh, to sort of uh, to, to betray a religious principle, doesn't it? To say, I refuse to take this down as a matter of principle. This is what I believe. Absolutely. Someone's being killed for what they believe. I'd say it's hard to say it's any different from being killed for being a Christian or a, a Jew or a Muslim. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent point. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. I have three questions. C can you hear? <laughs> can you I, I was wondering how many hours did you shoot? How long did it take you to edit it? And then all the little, re not reenactments, but the little mini things that they enacted. Did you edit those together and then give them DVD, like copies of the movies that they were making within the movie? Because when they were watching it on TV, no, so it looked like so they were watching something that you. Yeah, edited so I'll, I'll answer that question first. Um, in the two years, all of the perpetrators I met from two thousand three onwards, uh, for the two years before I met Anwar Congo, they would invite me to the place that they killed, launching these kind of spontaneous demonstrations of how they killed, uh, complain if they hadn't thought to bring along a friend to play a victim or a machete to use as a, a prop. And I felt I was getting something, and this is also crucial to the distinction uh, between my work and Ricky Pond's work, I felt I was getting something much closer to performance than what we think of as testimony. And Performance is always intended for an audience. And my question was, but who is their imagined audience? How do they want me to see them? How do they want the world to see them through my camera? How do they see each other? How do they want to see themselves? And how do they really see themselves? And I felt that, that, that those were the key questions to answer, to understand how we as human beings live with this, and how we make right history justifying evil. And so I, I started to propose to them long before I met Anwar Congo, look, you've participated in one of the biggest killings in human history. I want to know what it means to you and your society. You want to show me what you've done. So show me what you've done in whatever way you wish. I will film your dramatizations, but I will also film you and your fellow death squad members discussing what you want to show, and just as importantly, what you want to leave out. And in this way, we'll uh, combine the material and show how you want to be seen. So. The method was never, they never thought they were making uh, set short films that were s separate from what I was doing or that they were making their own film. There's no film within a film. And similarly, the method was not a trick to get them to open up. It was a response to their openness, a way of trying to analyze it. Why are they open and for who? Uh, in terms of 
So no, they never received a DVD of the scenes. The scenes have no meaning outside of the whole film. And as soon as I focused on Anwar, he came to understand that right away. And we had a method which was we would shoot one scene, starting with that very first one on the roof where he dances, and then he would watch it. And then in response, he would usually feel uncomfortable and as a way of escaping from that discomfort, propose another scene. That it, as though if he could somehow fix the scene aesthetically, he could fix himself and it passed morally. And so he just kept proposing one scene after another in a kind of recursive process. It went on for, uh, with some breaks in between, but on for five years. And over that five years, I suppose what was propelling him forward always was his own conscience. I think his need to run away from the pain and discomfort of shooting the previous scene. And in that sense, it's not so surprising that, uh, that maybe the scenes would become a kind of prism through which he sees the meaning of what he's done in some, in some way, because what was motivating the creation was his conscience from the beginning, I think. That said, uh, Anwar, also, the, I mean, sorry, for that reason, Anwar also knew the scenes had no meaning outside of this process. We had, out of the five years of shooting, we shot 1,200 hours of material. Uh, it took three, nearly three years to edit. There was a year and a half working with two editors together, um, uh, side by side, full time, and then a year cutting down the 1,200 hours to 43 hours, no, to 23 hours of uh, edited scenes and then a year cutting the four, 23 hours of edited scene down into the film, which is scene. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Has the UN attempted to rewrite the definition of genocide? Has the UN attempted to what, correct to, it? Uh, yes, correct the definition of genocide. Not, not that I know of, I don't think it's been revisited. In fact, I think that, I mean, I think governments in general, the, the UN Convention, such as it's written, and I'm not an expert, I'm not really not an expert in this, but I, 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 it, it, uh, it, it's strongly enough written that if something is called a genocide, it demands action from signatures to the convention. People, they have to do something. So the real the tradition is not that, uh, so much so that where you might expect, for example, in the Cold War, that the U.S. would constantly be saying the communists were committing genocide, and the communists would constantly be saying the Western Allied dictatorships were committing genocide. That didn't happen as much as you would think, because countries were reluctant to get entangled in in in, in military or peacekeeping action because they which they would be obligated to undertake if something is a genocide. So there's been really very little, I think, international will to expand the definition because it's the headache for countries when things are called a genocide. There's a famous scene uh, at a press conference in the White House in the 90s during the Rwandan genocide where the White House representative wouldn't say genocide but would say acts of genocide. And it's, it, it's, yeah, it's that's right. Awkward, right, right, right. awkward, convoluted press conference, but they just didn't want to say that because that wouldn't obligate the United States to immediately intervene in Rwanda. Uh, you sort of already hinted at what I was going to ask, but um, would would you rec would he recommend? Um, I'm sorry. Why did he choose to do Indonesia, and would he recommend other creative artists to try to provide a voice for other indigenous communities that have faced similar acts of genocide in like uh, North Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere in Asia? I think that um, there could be, there, there's really scope for doing this kind of work in any country where there's impunity, and I think, including in the United States, um, absolutely, I mean, there's impunity for so many, uh, America is, is, not only is there impunity for the Indonesian genocide, which you can see was American policy as well, this is not just Indonesian history, this is American history, but we have impunity for the Native American genocide, for slavery, for a um, hundred years of apartheid, for ongoing economic apartheid, for the execution of people just because of the color of their skin in our cities again and again. I mean, there's just so much impunity and therefore fear because impunity always 
com is shadowed by fear. It's, it, in fact, exists, I think, to create fear and then silence. Um, it's, it's, one could do this in the United States, but you could do this certainly in Central America and so many places where there's been atrocities and political violence uh, and, and there's been no justice. Now, whether it's a, you really have to look on a case-by-case -case basis whether it would be necessary for an outsider to come in as it was in Indonesia. An, an Indonesian could not have made alone the act of killing or the look of silence. There's a big Indonesian crew and someone, a man I've credited my co-director on both films, who I didn't do this alone at all. I mean, these are people who gave 10 years of their lives, uh, some of them changing their careers. Some were, were university professors, human rights lawyers, uh, NGO, heads of environmental NGOs who took, initially took little sabbaticals to work with me, but then found they were couldn't look away, just as I couldn't initially. And they spent more and more and more time till some of them had changed their careers knowing they couldn't take credit for this work until there's real substantial political change in Indonesia. So uh, whether you need an outsider to play the role I played, it very much depends on the circumstance in each country. I think in the United States, you would not need that uh, to, to address impunity in the United States. An American could do that and should do that. And when you don't need an outsider, it's better if it's not done by an outsider, I think. But um, in terms of how I came to Indonesia, it was through that initial project. I was just, I, I could have really been sent anywhere to work with plantation workers. They, in fact, it was, it was a project of the International Union of Food and Agricultural Workers, which is based in Geneva. It's a union of unions. So if you were in a farm workers union or the hotel and restaurant employees uh, union, HERE in the United States, you would automatically be a member of the International Union of Food and Agricultural Workers through your union. And so they could have sent me anywhere in the world. They considered Colombia, they considered Bangladesh, they considered uh, Moldova in Eastern Europe. In the end, they, they sent me to India. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, two more questions. One simple, what was the fish that, that, that's at the beginning and the end, but is that to begin with? And then as a filmmaker, how are you able to kind of, how did this affect you in terms of turning off yourself, like filming the shakedown in the market, hearing them talking about killing people, the one assistant who seems to confront them and say, you killed my dad, and then when he's being fake killed, seems to really think he's being killed. How do you remain an observer and not a, what the fuck's going on, stop? Well, the, the fish, um, I'll start with, that was a the easy restaurant. It's <laughs> sort of the easy question, with the fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're, 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 they're both fine. Uh, the fish was a restaurant until the Asian economic crisis, and by the time I, which was in 1997, it closed down. By the time I got there, it was kind of decomposing. Well, no, kind of rusting and, and covered with ma mold and moss and mildew, but it was not decomposing. It was but it's one of those art, It's one of those artifacts from the 90s, like you see in Jakarta, that are just shut down from the crisis. It's been almost 20 years, and you'll see these structures yeah. just rusting away. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. But it was, it, it, it yeah. our Anwar was looking for a location for a musical number about disappointment. And we came across it as we were driving, we were location scouting, and as we were driving, we were driving along this road and came around a bend, and there, there it was, overlooking Lake Toba. And I thought, if you're a filmmaker of any quality at all, at such a moment, you pull over. You don't <laughs> pass a location like that by. And you certainly don't think, oh, my film's about a serious topic and this is a frivolous fish. You stop. So we stopped and um, Anwar said, this is so perfect for the song about disappointment because it, it, it's so, it was once so beautiful and special and now look how it's sort of crumbling away and rotting away. And so, and I thought it was perfect as well. And well, I never show you the scene that they're shooting there. I just show kind of these strange dreamlike outtakes while they're practicing dances, while they're, there is one day, the final shot is, of course, a scene that they're shooting, it is, a, is a scene that they shot, a shot that we took for the musical number, but the camera's so far back that it was really useless for the musical. But it became, they had this uh, feeling of really apocalypse and beauty, kind of, that, that I felt embodied the meaning of the whole film, devastation and beauty. Uh, 
and so I, I didn't. I had a choice: do I show the musical number that they're actually shooting there, the way I do with the fit, the waterfall, or do I use these artifacts from the production of the musical um, as kind of as kind of uh, moments that embody metaphors that take you into the meaning of the whole film? And I I chose the latter. I think that uh, the final shot is. Is, I'll just say something not so much about the fish, but about the lake behind the fish. The lake is the crater lake at Lake Toba. Now, Lake Toba was formed about 50 to 75,000 years ago when the Toba supervolcano erupted. And it created a volcanic winter so severe that it killed. There was a mass extinction and it killed almost every human being on the planet. There were millions of us 75,000 years ago already. But the fossil record shows that we were sort of everywhere dispersed around, uh, at least around, uh, at least around Africa, and then um, there was a layer of ash, and then we reappear. And if you look at the DNA of everyone in in the world, actually, we have only fifty thousand to seventy five thousand years of evolutionary divergence among us. We came from a very small band of like a thousand people, fifty thousand years ago, who survived this near extinction. So it, it was, uh, it's called the Toba evolutionary bottleneck. And so in that final shot, when they're sort of lost in Anwar's fantasies and in the, in the, in the kind of, in this glittering incandescent lie of celebrating genocide as something heroic, they really are dancing on the edge of the abyss there in that shot. Because that's where we almost all ended. And uh, the question about how I, how I deal with, you know, when you spend so many years working on a project that's exploring the, exploring how we do this kind of violence to each other and how a whole society can be numbed to it to the point that people can boast about it and talk about it as though they're talking about the weather, you really don't want to be numb yourself. And you certainly don't want to find that through the production you're re replicating the very violence that you're aiming to critique and expose. And uh, I took very serious precautions throughout the film to avoid those things. If I started to feel numb or exhausted, that we would stop, we would take a break. And if anyone important in the crew was feeling numb or exhausted, we would stop and take a break. And then there's scenes, there's maybe three scenes in the film that look that are sort of particularly disturbing. You describe two of them, the shakedown one in the uh, market and the, and the scene with Suriono when he talks about his stepfather being killed. Well, the third, I would say, is the scene where the village is being burned down. It looks like a village is being burned down. But like the fire alarm that you had today, uh, when there was no fire. In fact, there was not a village being burned down there. That was a film set. And everyone in that set, all of the people playing survivors and victims, are the children and grandchildren of the perpetrators and the paramilitary leaders. And the children who are crying are auditioned for their ability to cry. Uh, they, and those who can cry are in front of the cameras and close to the cameras, and those who are giggling are further back, obscured by smoke uh, and fire, so you don't see that they're laughing. The, I made a rule that I said, I, 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 I made a rule to my, with my crew and with myself that we would not tell the children that this was something that their parents or grandparents had really done. And I urged the parents and grandparents not to tell their relatives if they didn't already know that this was something they'd really done now. I said, that's something you should really have time to think about. If you're thinking you want to tell them now for the scene, then I ask you not to be in the scene. Uh, think about it. It's something you should think about over time, you should talk about over time, you shouldn't rush that conversation through this scene. Um, that's that scene. Then the scene with the village market, it was devastating to film that. When Herman and Safi told me they wanted me to, that they made their money this way and that I should film how they do it, they They, I asked, they said, asked for you to film the shakedown. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm following them. I have to yeah. have their, <laughs> they yeah. have to work with them. And I went and told my crew, what do you think we should do? And they said, you have to film this, my Indonesian crew said, because it happens in every, as you'll know, I, I see you know a lot about Indonesia. 
you're, you're an Indonesianist somehow. But, <laughs> somehow. Um, somehow. <laughs> yes, in Indonesia. So, um, as you'll know, this happens in every market, in every sizable town, every day in Indonesia. But it never filmed. And the crew said, everyone knows it happens, so film it. It'll be another one of these kind of not historiographic interventions, but kind of political interventions where people will be forced to acknowledge what's going on right under their noses. But people uh, never are able to document it. And I said, well, so I thought, how can I do this without becoming complicit? How can I do it without being, uh, without the, 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 the market sellers feeling like, jo like well, uh, now these people are so powerful, they have their own TV crew in front of whom they can shake us down with impunity. And what I decided to do was to tell Safi and Herman, look, once you get your money, move on, maybe 50 yards, wait for me, I'm going to get a release form signed. But I wasn't getting release forms signed. Well, I, I did that too, but later. What I was doing was explaining why we were there, for real, the real reason that we were exposing this. And I was paying everybody back. So it wasn't a perfect solution, and it certainly didn't offer me any comfort when I witnessed them being intimidated and frightened. But because it, it doesn't make that better, but it was how I made, was able to film it, how I was able to live with my conscience filming that. And then I, uh, it was devastating. And the scene with Suriono uh, that you described, he's the most complicated of all. Uh, I didn't know his story when I filmed the reenactment. He told that story at lunch in the television studio, and I was filming with Adi Zulkadri in another part of the studio. You saw Adi would come up from Jakarta for the shooting. There's that scene where he arrives on the screen. So I only had him for like two or three days on that, on that shoot, and I uh, was trying to use, film with him as much as possible, and I wasn't filming the lunch break. I was filming with Adi, and so I didn't hear the story, and I didn't hear the story until I got back to England, where I was living at the time, uh, to and, and going through all of the side conversations that had been captured by other cameras. It had been captured by one Indonesian uh, sort of camera assistant who didn't think anything of it, and my cinematographer was Colombian and doesn't speak Indonesian. And so we, we, we missed the story, but if I, and as soon as I heard it, I felt terrible. I thought uh, if I'd heard it, I would have pulled him aside and said, you know, you shouldn't be here spend the rest of the day behind the camera with me and tomorrow helping me and tomorrow say you have a flu and don't come back. And I had a choice whether to put it in or not. I felt, uh, I felt exposed putting it in, but I felt it would be a lie not to. But if I could do it over again, no matter how strong it makes the film, I would, I would take him out. He shouldn't, I wouldn't have had him in, this, in the film if I knew his background. There was a principle that there should be no survivors in the film, and he kind of slipped through the crack because he happened to be a paramilitary leader and a member of a theater paramilitary Panchasila youth theater troupe that Harriman had been in, and Harriman had remembered him as a wonderful actor and a loyal paramilitary member. So we didn't, we didn't know. Wow. Any more questions? Yeah, please. Um, I'm just wondering, like, how comfortable were you with Anwar and everything? I mean, like, he's telling you all these, like, disturbing things that he did, yet, like, he seems kind of, like, friendly with you, and he said you keep in touch now. I'm just wondering how you, like, had to balance all that. Like, how controlled did you have to be with him and stuff like that? You know, it's tricky. I... I it wasn't comfortable. Comfortable is the wrong word. <laughs> it was, um, you know, the scene at, the night after he did, the, after he butchered the, the night of the, the, the night the, the, when he butchered the teddy bear. That was one of the most terrible things I've ever seen, because he was blaming his victim. He was finding it. He couldn't escape his own feeling of guilt. The guilt was hurting him, and he had this kind of perverse victim-blaming thing that's common, I think, to how killers do this, where he said, sort of, well, got angry at the victim, it fuels the torture of that anger, and it's as though, like, it, it, it's though, uh, you know, by you, by killing you, by torturing you, it hurts me, and so you're hurting me. And he feels like this sort of victim of his own victim, and he, 
butchers the teddy bear and says at the end, this is what we do to people who bribe us with their children. So he becomes self-righteous. And he says, you are the real barbarian. Self-righteous and self-pitying. Those two, self-pity and self-righteousness always go together. Uh, they're the same emotion, really. Just a more a different kind of level of energy involved. And then you see him lying on his bed uh, with this wind-up chicken singing this song of total self-pity, and then he plays the victim. And people who've only seen a shorter theatrical cut of the film or a TV cut of the film maybe think that him playing the victim was a kind of challenge I set for him. But actually, or something that he just arrived at because he started to feel guilty, like out of his own conscience. He, so, but actually, as you see in, this, in the full cut of the film that you've just watched, he plays the victim out of self-pity initially, and then something changes in him. But that day where I saw the, him play the, where I saw him butcher the teddy bear, I went home feeling filthy. I think it was one of those first moments where performance had given way to reenactment, where some of the past was sort of rushing through the portal, if you like, or the channel of this, of this performance into the present. And I felt almost as though I was complicit with the killing themselves, as if I'd killed this baby. And I, no baby was killed, of course, it's just a teddy bear. But I went home that night, I had horrible nightmares. The next day I couldn't sleep because I was afraid of the nightmares. The next day I had nightmares again. And that cycle of insomnia and nightmares went on for eight months. I still have, I don't have the nightmares often at all, but I do still have. And I've never become a regular sleeper again since then. Um, what can I say? I mean, it wasn't comfortable, but I care for him. And I feel even something like love for him as a human being who I took this five-year journey with. It was a, people often say, was the act of killing in a scary film to make? I think they usually just mean, was it scary physically? Because I was working with these prominent and frightening perpetrators. In fact, it was rarely scary physically because the perpetrators rolled out a red carpet for everything we were doing. It was scary emotionally. The look of silence, which you're about to see, was scary physically, because Adi wanted, was Adi, Adi insisted that we confront the perpetrators, and because I'd made the act of killing, and I was known to be, for being close to the most powerful men in the country, because nobody had seen the act of killing yet when I shot the look of silence, I was believed, we realized that these men Adi wanted to confront wouldn't, wouldn't dare attack us physically. But following Adi on that journey, uh, where we get threatened, where we get, where we have a getaway car, where we have his family at the airport ready to evacuate if anything goes wrong. That was scary physically, but that was healing emotionally. Um, how, just to sort of wrap up, how about your relationship with some of the big fish in Indonesia today? You have a clip of Yusuf Kala giving a rather embarrassing speech to the Pemuda Pancasila. He was vice president at the time, and he's vice president again right now. And, um, so it, it, didn't, it didn't hurt him. Yeah. <laughs> speech. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, what, the speech was embarrassing, but not that harmful to it politically. Yeah. What, um, so how, how has the, the upper levels of the, uh, the military uh, and the uh, former Suharto and sort of fall out from the Suharto uh, group and the political leadership. How, what's their response and what does it mean for you in terms of continued work in Indonesia? I, I can't return. I still receive pretty regular threats um, through social media. They tapered off a little since the Oscars. Uh, and, but but, but uh, through social media, through, through email, through an old phone number. When I was shooting, I was living in London, and I kept that number alive because I had a sense that maybe people would want to reach me on it. And then just before the film came out, I had the idea with the producer that we would renew that number so that we'd see if, if people were going to threaten us, it would come to that number. And indeed, I get voicemails pretty regularly to that number, which are pretty ugly. They're conditional. They're like, don't return to Indonesia unless you want your bald head to be used as a football. Uh, so I can avoid going, that's easy. I don't just don't go back to Indonesia and then my bald head hopefully doesn't get used as a football. Um, so I would say that uh, I, I haven't been able to safely return. I haven't felt that I could safely return. I, I 
know people, I, I know of a man who looks a little bit like me and that he has a bald head, but he's, he looks, he's taller and in every other way looks different and he's French. That he was in Indonesia filming interviews on something totally different and he went to a, a, a screening of The Look of Silence and he was arrested and almost deported and thought that he was a, they thought that he would claim that he was me on a false passport. So, I mean, if that happens to him, I don't know what would happen in Poland. Well, um, I would personally just want to thank you so much for these films. Um, and on behalf of the College of Arts and Letters, the Festival of the Arts, and Sacramento State, thank you for staying up late and taking this time to talk with us. Thank you.